Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Becky Fish with Onset. I'm an application specialist for water quality and water level applications. And I have with me Inzli Hexafi, who's going to present the, um, uh, excuse me, webinar about our new Bluetooth PH data logger. Um, just want to give you a little bit of background about Inzli. She is our product marketing specialist for water quality. Um, she grew up enjoying sailing, water skiing, fishing, and just really loved to learn the aquatic world. She has several years of experience with marine applications. She has done work with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. She also completed an internship at the Moat Marine Aquarium, the Center for Shark Research in Sarasota, Florida. And she has a master's degree in developmental shark biology from University of Rhode Island. Inslee also has six years of experience in the water quality industry, including five years in the analytical equipment side. And now she's been with Onset most recently for almost two years. Um, I'm just in a moment here, gonna turn over the presentation to Inslee and we'll welcome any questions throughout the presentation or at the end. Thank you so much for attending. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar today about pH um, and our brand new logger, the MX2501. I am sorry, we just sort of got this a little backwards today. Um, happy rainy Wednesday. <laughs> the webinar should be about an hour long and it is being recorded and will be made available to all of the attendees afterwards. Um, it's really important at this point for you to let us know if you can hear us. Um, if not, you might want to check your audio settings, see if you're connected through the telephone or the mic and speakers. And if um, you're trying to listen through your computer, then you might want to make sure that you are not listening through your telephone. Um, also, we have a questions box. This is going to be useful throughout. I'm probably going to focus more on answering the questions at the end. Um, but Becky's going to monitor for me, those for me as well. So if there's something that's super urgent or relevant, um, then you will, um, then she'll highlight it to me and I'll just try to answer that. Uh, at this point, I'm just going to ask everyone to make sure they can hear. And I'm going to pause to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to figure that out if they can't. And if you can't, please shoot us over a question. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions so far. Thanks, Natalia. <laughs> um, we are definitely going to move on then and get going with this. So as Becky said, I am Inslee. Um, I am somewhat newish to Onset. I've been here for just over a year and a half, and I'm really excited to take what I've learned in my experience um, and making our water market as best as it can be for you guys. So thanks again for joining me. Um, and before I get started with the agenda, I just wanted to let you all know that I appreciate those people who sent uh, questions ahead of time um, to, to me because it really helps me make the presentation as easy as possible for you guys to understand and, and as comprehensive as you need it. So I hope to touch on all of the answers that I had for those questions. If I don't, again, please feel free to uh, use that questions box and we will get back to you. So the plan for today is to briefly cover pH theory um, and then we'll go through our brand new product, the MX2501 pH data logger. And then I will mention a couple applications and some frequently asked questions. Um, hopefully those will answer all of the questions. So let's start with a brief pH theory review. Um, throughout the presentation, we're also going to be doing a couple of polls. I think I have four or five of them, just to keep you guys engaged, but also because I'd really like to know more about you all. So this first poll is, what would you say is your level of knowledge regarding pH? Uh, so if you have a chance, start filling that out. Um, I'm gonna continue going while you do, and Becky will monitor that uh, as we go. Hopefully, though, I will be answering most of your questions. Okay. Um, so, 
Well, we're starting with the definition of pH. Oh, sorry. Okay, so pH is the power or the potential of hydrogen, which is the hydrogen ion H plus. Um, it depends on who you talk to. Technically, the uh, it could be power, it could be potential. In reality, it's meant to be a measurement of the activity of the hydrogen ion um, concentrate. Oh, sorry, of the hydrogen ion, but. Uh, since the activity is very similar to the concentration, most people tend to refer to it as the concentration of hydrogen. What this means is they use this equation, which would say in, in the theoretical use of it, pH equals negative log of the hydrogen ion activity, but as most people understand it, it is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. pH is based on water. Uh, it specifically is discussing water's dissociation into hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. That's what we're showing here with the H plus and OH negative. Um, in pure water, hydrogen ions are present in the same concentration as hydroxyl ions, and this concentration equals 10 to the negative 7 molar or moles per liter. So what this... Um, means is that if you put that information into the pH equals negative log of the hydrogen concentration, you'll find that pure water, absolutely pure, which is a really hard thing to do unless you're in a very good lab, um, is pH 7 because you put 10 to the negative 7 in there and then you end up with a pH of 7. So I'm just going to review the poll really quickly. Let me just get my mouse working. Um, the results are most of you have some experience, which is great. Some of you are beginners, um, and that's great as well because this logger is meant to be um, accessible to beginners, intermediate users, and even experts. So I'm happy to see a lot of experts out there too, and I hope if I misspeak, you'll call me out on it. <laughs> uh, so that's great. Moving forward. Okay, so. Now that we've talked about what um, pH is, we can talk about what an acid and a base is. So on the left, we have an acid, and we know it's an acid because it has an excess of hydrogen ions. If you look at this little guy here, we have this is a water molecule, and it has two H's and an O. Uh, and when these dissociate or separate from each other, you end up with um, hydrogen ions hydroxyl ions, which are the oxygen and hydrogen, and then also very, very briefly oxygen um, ions. So these, this is constantly moving. The molecules are constantly dancing together and joining up and, and separating. Uh, and when you have an excess of the hydrogen ions, you are looking at an acid. But on the right, when you have an excess of hydroxyl ions, you are looking at a base. So in this case, we can see in this beaker with the big green ions, um, a lot more of the oxygen and hydrogen pairs, and that's the hydroxyl ion. So this one on the right is a base, and the one on the left is a, an acid. Because the pH scale is logarithmic, uh, it's important to remember that a change in hydrogen concentration between one pH unit and the next pH unit is a decadal change, which means it increases or decreases 10 times. So what you can see here is our acidic range is always um, 7 to 0, and our alkaline range is always 7 to 14. And that little buffer in the middle, sort of, no pun intended, is the, the neutral zone. So 7 area is neutral. Um, but you can see that when you have a pH of 10, for instance, this is the concentration you have. And if you change that pH to down one unit even to nine, um, you've lost a 10 spot, essentially. So when people say it only changed from pH 1 to pH 2, sometimes that's a pretty significant change for the sample that you're measuring. Okay, so that was our very brief pH theory review, and I'm happy to open up to you guys um, that 
I would be happy to answer any more specific questions. I just didn't want to bore you and put you to sleep on this afternoon. <laughs> so we're going to move on over to the product overview. Um, and this is a lot more extensive, obviously. It's really why we're here. So our product details. Um, first, I'm going to cover the method. pH is inferred or derived from the variables below with uh, a formula that's well known in the industry called the Nernst equation. And the variables that are measured by the logger include temperature and potential. The logger is capable of uh, reporting temperature as Fahrenheit, but for the equation's sake, it is using uh, Celsius. Constants that are known are the Nernstian slope or the, the Faraday's constant and uh, gas law and so on. Um, and then the electro electrode slope and offset, which are determined through calibration with at least a pH 7 and one other standard or buffer. The MX2501 is for aqueous measurements. Uh, pH is an aqueous measurement, and therefore this is not meant to be measuring the pH of, for instance, oil spills in the ocean. Some people are interested in that. Um, it, can, it's not, it, it can't measure the pH of the oil, uh, it just as water. But it is deployable in fresh or salt water. Key features of the product include that it's, first of all, competitively priced at just under $700. This is for a standalone logger um, that includes pH measurements, temperature measurements, and comes with several accessories, which I'll show you on the next page. Um, also, a robust uh, PVC body, which allows us to keep that cost at a really good level. Uh, that is good for freshwater or saltwater environments, and it has a user replaceable AA battery. So that's really nice because um, a lot of our users enjoy being able to replace the battery even though it has an exquisite life, lifetime. And I'll cover that again when I go into the specs. Okay. It communicates over Bluetooth to iOS and Android mobile devices that are running the most recent Hobo Mobile app. pH calibration, which is normally a very tedious process and somewhat easy, depending on your level of experience, to mess up, uh, can be easily followed uh, on screen with the Hobo Mobile app, which walks you through. And again, I will, sh I will show you that in a minute. It also has our proprietary battery saving water detection system that signals to the logger when to advertise its BLE signal. And again, this is covered in more detail. Finally, it has a glass ball plastic body pH electrode with a gel non-refillable electrolyte and a Pellon or fabric junction with an accuracy of plus or minus 0 0.10 pH units. <laughs> that was a lot to say, so I'm gonna give you a second to take that all in. Okay, so the components that come with that 695 uh, price tag include the logger itself, a, um, a copper bio, anti-biofouling copper guard, which is an optional thing for you to use. You don't necessarily have to use it, but it does come included. And um, it also will come with storage solution, a cotton swab and silicone oil for greasing up the uh, O-rings. And, and, and the electrode as well. Okay, so in more detail, we have the mounting end cap. So I'm gonna pretty much cover the two end caps and the electrode on this slide. The mounting end cap has the TPE switch for BLE, um, a lanyard for the mounting loop and the LEDs that, that communicate to you what's going on. The sensor end cap, has our water detect nodes, as well as the temperature sensor and the electrode guard. Uh-oh, that's supposed to say pH electrode. <laughs> so our pH electrode is a proprietary electrode with a three and a half millimeter connector. It, as I said, is the glass bulb style with a double cloth junction 
electro it's double cloth junction, a gel internal electrolyte that is not replaceable, and a polycarbonate body. And it's really in terms of the depth that the logger can reach, it's really um, dependent on this on the electrode. Okay, so we are here for another poll, making sure you're still awake. Just kidding. <laughs> um, are you currently using the Hobo Mobile or MX products? Simple, we're just doing some, uh, we're interested to see. Okay, so while you all answer, um, I am going to continue. Let me see if I can do this. I can. I'm trying to get back. Okay, well, with the poll, it looks like most of you are not familiar with Hobo Mobile. Uh, I didn't go into too much detail about what Hobo Mobile itself looks like, just how pH is handled in it. So if you would like to hear more about Hobo Mobile, you're more than welcome to contact uh, the appropriate sales representative. I did see one question just pop up, which is pertinent to that, Inslee. Someone's asking if Hobo Mobile app is free, and yes, it is. It's a free download to your mobile iOS or Android device as of today. And we will be releasing support for Hobo Mobile on a laptop um, with Bluetooth capability sometime probably in the next three to six months. Thanks, Becky. Mm -hmm. Okay, so configuration options. <laughs> this somewhat is somewhat irrelevant at this point, but they are the same as other products on the Hobo Mobile platform, um, except for there are two channels and you cannot turn them off and that's temperature and pH. The, the pH channel obviously can't be turned off because you're using a pH logger and temperature can't be turned off because you can't have pH without temperature. However, you can still set an alarm for, um, for both of those parameters. Calibration of the electrode, as I said earlier, is, um, is super easy. We tried really hard to make it accessible to almost everybody, those novice people, the beginner people, the intermediates, and also without making the experts sit there and roll their eyes at how much they have to be told as they're going through it. So this is uh, when you start a calibration, what you're, you're faced with, you're offered three options. It's always going to be no less than a two point calibration and I'll explain that also in the future. Some helpful screens along the way. This is just one of them that'll show you when your buffer has been accepted, meaning it's within range. It is definitely reading, you know, if it's looking for a pH four buffer and it's definitely in a pH four buffer, it'll know, it'll measure that as your, your reading. <clears throat> and once you've done your pH seven buffer, you'll be given an offset value. And once you're done your pH four buffer or 10, you will also be given a slope. Uh, these are two parameters or pieces of information that are useful for understanding your electrode condition. And um, I dive into that a lot more later. When your calibration is complete, if you've completed a three-point calibration, for instance, like in this image, you will see all of the buffers, the temperatures they were calibrated, and you'll be given the option to save the calibration. But what we've done, too, is made it somewhat easier for those people who aren't familiar with slope and offset to understand what would be an acceptable slope or an offset for a pH electrode. Um, and it guides you there. So it's saying, you know, this is what's acceptable. And then at the bottom, it's telling you what you have. And so it's really nice to see uh, some guidance, but it can also be easily overlooked if you're an expert and don't need to know that. So you just hit save calibration and move on and your logger's calibrated. We also have throughout the calibration warnings that come up. For instance, uh, this, this electrode was placed in pH 10 buffer and it was looking for pH seven. So um, a warning came up and said, you are definitely not in the, um, well, it said you have a bad pH value. You should check your buffer, clean your electrode and start over. So these are just guidances that we were hoping that would make it easier to perform a calibration in the proper way along the whole way and, and you'd have accurate data. Okay, so I am going to now move on to pH calibration. 
The purpose of pH calibration is to compensate for manufacturing tolerances, electrode aging, and electrode conditioning and cleaning. So the image here is showing you a couple things. Uh, you can first see this, the three layers that are on the glass bulb of the pH electrode. The inner layer is an inner hydrated gel layer. We say it's a gel layer, but it's like microscopic. So it's not like a Petri dish. It's just there, very thin. And the middle layer is your glass. Uh, it's an ion sensitive glass. And then the outer layer is your outer hydrated layer. This outer layer is why we store electrodes in storage solution to keep this and the junction properly uh, moisturized. But when you have a dirty electrode or a cracked electrode, uh, you will get false readings, the dirt buildup or grime, or even if it's oil for some reason, uh, will definitely cause drift in your readings, as well as any cracks will potentially affect your reading. If it's a micro crack, it, it actually could potentially change your, your potential uh, that is observed. In order to do a calibration, you are required to use pH buffer solutions. So uh, laboratory equipment, for instance, allows you to do custom buffers and buffers at different values. Um, in this case, the, the MX2501 uh, will only read buffers 4.01, 7.00, and, and 10.01. Um, this is meant to create a linear graph, so you always have to do at least two, and you also need to uh, always do seven so that you get your offset. So as I just said, our calibration options with the pH, with, the, with our pH logger are three point, four, seven, and 10, or two point with either seven and four or seven and 10 buffers. And once you've successfully completed a calibration, um, you will, be given two correction factors, offset and slope. So I, I see a question here. I'm just going to answer it real quick. The question is about how the process goes with the buffers. We always start with pH 7 because we have to determine that offset first. And then if you're doing a three point, you go to four and then 10. If you're doing a two point, you go from seven to whichever other one you were um, choosing. So you, it actually is directing you from seven to either four or 10. But a three point will always go to four after seven. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so the correction factors that I, factors that I mentioned, uh, the first one is offset. This will always be the first one found because you will always have to start in pH seven. And what the offset is, is the potential or the millivolt reading at pH seven buffer. Theoretical ideal is zero at 25 degrees Celsius, but acceptable range is plus or minus 30 millivolts. And this can be affected by temperature, which I'll go into um, in a bit. If you have a bad offset or if it's reporting that your offset isn't good or um, there are any questions about the offset, you probably should start by cleaning the electrode and then starting calibration over. Here's an image of a, an offset that isn't ideal, obviously. I mean, it's in within the range of acceptable, but it's not zero. So that's your offset there. And this is a graph of pH versus potential. So the other factor is slope. Uh, it is the change in potential between at least two buffer values. So this is expressed as potential over pH and reported as a percentage of the ideal slope. So the ideal slope, the Ernstian slope, is negative 59.16 at 25 degrees C. Um, and the way that slope is reported is it's reported as a percentage of that value. Um, the the uh, value that is observed when you're doing your calibration will be compared to the 59.16 and you're given um, a percentage and the acceptable range for this is 85 to 105 percent. And if it's outside of that and you have a bad slope, then we recommend first checking your buffers. Um, otherwise, you might have a cracked electrode or you might need to clean your electrode as well. The question that someone just sent said, will onset cell pH calibration solution? And yes, as a matter of fact, in addition to the logger and the other accessories mentioned, we are selling 
pH 4, 7, and 10 buffer, as well as storage solution. Um, and we can either do that individual bottles or as a pack and a calibration kit or in a maintenance kit that also includes um, the storage solution and beakers. <clears throat> okay, one more poll. Wakey, wakey. <laughs> one more poll. What do you use to determine electrode condition? Okay, launch. Well, these data are very interesting. I'm going to keep going because I would like to give you time to answer this. Well, it won't let me keep going. So I'm going to give you a second. I am going to share these data with you. Okay. Interesting to note, not a lot of you are using anything to understand your electrode condition, which is um, fascinating to me. And also, it's it's the blame is definitely on the manufacturers. I would I would argue that very comfortably. Uh, those who are using slope only, it's great that you're actually doing slope. And um, but and as I'll explain later, the the electrode condition really depends on both slope and offset. Same with the offset people. Those doing slope and offset, nice job. That's what you should be doing uh, to really understand the electrode condition and to make sure that you know that the data you're reading are actually correct. Um, and those that are doing other, I'm intrigued to hear what you're doing to understand your electrode condition. Thanks for responding. Okay, so here's how we interpret slope and offset. This is a graph of potential versus pH again with three lines on it, and these are three different calibrations. The first one, oh, oh, the first one is the blue line there. And as you can see, it goes right through zero millivolts at pH seven. And it has, you can't really see that off the top of your head, but it does have an ideal slope. So this is what we would call our ideal electrode. This is the line we wish we could get all the time. And that is a negative 59.16 millivolt per pH or 100% slope and an offset of zero millivolts. Then we have this line where we have the slope out of range. It's a, it's too steep. And the offset though is still going through zero at seven, pH seven. So it's within the accuracy or within the acceptable range of plus or minus 30 millivolts. In this case, it's possible that the buffers are contaminated because those uh, external buffers, four is usually pretty stable. It's, it's the 10 that can get pretty contaminated pretty easily. If that gets contaminated, then you're not sure if that reading is really accurate. And I would like to note there are other things that can affect this, um, the slopes, and I, and I am going to touch on that in a bit. <clears throat> it's also possible, though, that you will need to replace your electrode. The red line, uh, if you can see that it's red, is uh, has a fine slope. It's actually an identical slope to um, the blue line. It's meant to be, and that means it has a 100% slope, which is within the range of 85 to 105% is what that should read. The offset, though, is out of range. It is at negative 50 millivolts, and that is well outside the negative 30 millivolt acceptable range. So in this case, um, some things that can cause that is that you have a dirty electrode or dirty junction, um, and again, it might require replacing. It might not be repairable. Some other uh, troubleshooting tips and tricks here. They no slope, you know, if it doesn't have any slope, mainly on our logger, it's instead of saying there's no slope, it's going to say in the second buffer that you have an issue. There's no reading or the reading, you'll see the potential is also very close to the potential at pH seven. In that case, the electrode is likely to have a crack and you will need to replace it. Um, because a pH meter or a pH logger like this one can always log potential. It can always measure a potential whether you have a cracked electrode or not. I mean, you could even have an electrode not on it and it would still be measuring um, a potential of the system. And then the last one, noise or slow response. There are a couple things that can lead to this. One is a clogged or dirty junction. Again, clean the electrode. And when we say clean the electrode, we do not actually sell a cleaning solution 
we have decided that it's it's just as simple to wash your or soak your electrode in a dilute acid like vinegar or super dilute hydrochloric acid. And this will also help condition the electrode. So anytime I say clean, I'm referring to doing something like that. And anytime I say recondition, I'm also referring to that. Um, reconditioning is something that needs to be done to rehydrate that outer gel layer that I mentioned earlier. So it's important to keep it hydrated in order to read properly. Okay, one of the big things that can affect pH, as I said, it's one of the two variables and that is temperature. So this graph here is showing potential versus pH and the lines are representing different temperature uh, samples. So as you can see, the ideal is at 25, we say ideal, but it's a theoretical ideal at 25 degrees Celsius. And that's that really big dark line in the middle, it goes right through zero. So all of these lines actually represent theoretically perfect electrodes at different temperatures. What that means is that as your temperature changes, the reading, the perceived reading of pH changes. And this is something that's reported, it should be reported on the buffer bottles that you purchase. So if you purchase them from us, you will know that the pH at, for instance, 10 degrees Celsius is this exact value. Um, so when we're calibrating the logger, we take into account the pH, at, I'm sorry, the temperature at that buffer's current state. So, um, this is really important, for instance, because temperature affects obviously the physical properties of liquids, but it is also a key variable that will affect your future readings after the calibration. Um, so if you're deploying a logger, for instance, in you know, the mountains of Colorado, you would want to calibrate the electrode at the same temperature as the um, sample. In that case, it'd be easy. You could cool your buffer to the same temperature. Uh, maybe if you're calibrating and planning to deploy in the Bahamas, you will have much warmer water than 25 degrees C. Um, and so what you want to do is heat up your buffer to match that. And, and this is one of those um, <laughs> one of those things where you're not putting it on a hot plate and, and boiling it. That would sort of severely mess up the electrolytes inside of the buffer. So you would want to do this in a water bath that mimics. And so for those of you who are out in the field and recognize that being in a lab is not the same thing as being out in the field, it is also an option to just take your bottles and dunk them closed in the water and let them sit there and acclimate uh, in your sample. I would let it happen for long enough that it's within a you know plus or minus 10 degrees Celsius. Another effect on calibration is I've been told altitude makes sense. Pressure at altitudes other than sea level can also affect physical properties of liquid. So for those of you who are in the Andes Mountains or in the Himalayans, you will definitely want to calibrate your logger prior to deployment at altitude. Because <clears throat> this will affect it, especially for those mountain ranges. Okay, so tips on usage of the glass bulb electrodes. Uh, somebody asked ahead of time what, what technology is being used. This logger is using a glass bulb electrode. Um, <clears throat> it is not an ISPET and it is not photometric. So with glass bulb electrodes, this is the general purpose glass bulb electrode that you will see in a lot of places in a lot of different applications. But the proper use and maintenance of these electrodes is the same for all of those. And it starts with never touching ever the glass bulb. It's really bad to touch it. You might leave your oils on it. Those oils can cause drift. You can also crack it or scratch it. Um, it is a somewhat sensitive glass. I mean, it's pretty rugged, but you won't necessarily be able to see the effect of touching the glass bulb. So our recommendation is to not touch it. You want to remember to keep the temperature sensor, the bulb, and the junction submerged during deployment. 
So this is something that you'll see on the calibration scene of our of Hobo Mobile. And on the right, we say, for instance, remove the copper guard prior to calibrating. Also, it's good to remove it prior to storing it. And then submerge the junction and temperature sensor. It's really important that you don't just have the glass bulb submerged, but you also have to have the junction. In the case of this specific electrode, it's pretty easy to do because it's an annular junction, which means it is essentially the neck of the bulb. But with the logger, what's difficult or somewhat difficult and not too big of a bad thing if you're close to ambient temperature is that the temperature sensor, you really wanna make sure that that is submerged in your sample as well um, for calibration. When you're not using the electrode, it's good. To, it's important to store it in a proper storage solution. Onset does sell one. <clears throat> to do this, you'll want to definitely remove the copper guard because uh, the copper reacts with the salt content in the storage solution, and then you can have um, coppers and salts and leaching and crazy stuff. So we recommend taking it off. For long-term storage, occasionally it's important to refresh the storage solution and rinse the electrode. Um, just to make sure the storage solution is salty and somewhat acidic. And the idea is to keep bacterial growth down and to keep the uh, outer gel layer hydrated and the junction hydrated. So every once in a while, I mean, it is a tight seal, but it's, it's not always an airtight seal or maybe you didn't screw it on properly. You'll get some evaporation and increased salt content. So it'll be good to just rinse the electrode rinse out the storage solution and refresh it. Some questions about when to calibrate were, there were actually a couple of them that were sent to me. So I thought this was relevant to sort of highlight. Uh, the pH logger will come uncalibrated to you. And we have a couple of, you know, accoutrements on it that are showing you that you must calibrate before your first deployment. So with a new logger, with a new electrode, you always should, cal you'll, you'll have to calibrate the, um, the logger before your first deployment. If you get a replacement electrode, then you should always recalibrate after you've removed that electro the old electrode and put a new electrode in because um, just the action of doing that will change the reference potential. So it's important to, and, and different electrodes have different reference potentials, um, and that's just due to manufacturing manufacturing tolerances. So it's always good that after you replace the electrode to um, recalibrate. If you ever clean your electrode, drop your electrode. Dunk it in snow, dunk it in sand or dirt, anything. It's usually good to just recalibrate if at least to the one to the two point calibration. So the question that people really mean when they ask me when should I be calibrating it is the last one and that is the frequency of mid deployment calibrations. This depends on your application and your environment. My argument personally would be that out in the field, it's a little different than in the lab where a lot of people calibrate once or twice a day. But since the idea is that you're deploying this for long-term measurements, I would recommend, um, if possible, calibrating once a week. If not, then there has to be a certain level of understanding that there will be drift because a logger, a, a pH electrode left that long in one sample will have some drift. And this drift can be, there are two different kinds of drift. There's um, product drift, you know, me or measurement drift, sorry. Um, and that's just typical drift over the life of an electrode, for instance. And then there's fouling drift. And this is something that's particularly interesting for pH measurements. And that is that as you build up any fouling on the glass bulb, you will experience drift in your readings because of that slide I showed you earlier where there's a buildup of dirt, it changes the potential perceived by the logger. In that case, what we recommend usually is to deploy it um, for one or two weeks or take your other products that you have deployed as um, a reference and understand when you would be needing to go out there anyway for proper maintenance of those. Um, it's just one of those necessities that all pH products uh, must undergo. So uh, I, my argument is every time you go out to download data or um, check on the electrode, it wouldn't hurt to calibrate. The more calibrate, 
questions better. But understanding that these are usually field measurements. And as always, we love to tell customers, if you have further questions about calibration, maintenance, storage, et cetera, uh, you, we have a wonderful user manual that has lots of details. And I provide a link at the end of um, the slideshow uh, for that manual. In addition, I have, and I'm not sure if you noticed this, um, I have a handout listed. It is that the slide that I'll be getting to at the very end with helpful links for the MX2501. You're more than welcome to download it. Um, I actually would encourage you to download it because it is a useful tool. Okay, um, I'm going to move into uh, <clears throat> the specifications. To highlight um, specific specifications that were question or that there were questions about um, from the beginning. So sorry, from before the presentation, the webinar. Okay, so to start with, the pH range that the pH sensor is capable of measuring within is pH 2.00 to pH 12.00. So that covers both our resolution and the range. The resolution is 0 0.01, but this range is also the range that we uh, recommend the logger be deployed within. If you're deploying this logger, Thirteen. That's those are pretty extreme conditions, uh, and it is. I just like to remind you a PVC body. So my recommendation there is to check the chemical compatibility of the wetted materials in our logger with what you expect to find in your sample. This is all the accuracy is plus or minus zero point one zero pH units within plus or minus 10 degrees Celsius of the calibration temperature. That is a really important um, qualification because as I told you, temperature can affect the, um, the pH reading. And so if you do not calibrate within a certain range, the plus or minus 10 degrees Celsius of your sample, then, then likely you will um, see some accuracy drop off. <clears throat> Temperature sensor can measure between negative two and 50 degrees Celsius. I am going to quickly move to this slide because this is also the operating range for the logger. This means um, the logger can be deployed in negative two degrees Celsius water or below zero Celsius water, um, but it cannot be deployed in, it cannot be frozen. The electrode, if, if it's in, um, if it gets frozen, the glass ball will likely get cracked. And uh, if it's in freezing water, it's possible that the electrode will have difficulty reading because the gel electrolyte may, may get too cold. However, it is a salty 3.5 molar solution or gel, so it should be able to be, sorry, avoid freezing. The logger is waterproof to 40 meters. Some of you may know our other loggers, which are able to go much deeper. Um, this is limited. The limiting factor here is the pH electrode. Uh, that the logger itself, if it had a plug where the pH electrode was, could probably go to much, much deeper, but um, the electrode can't handle the pressures further than 40 meters. And we also have our proprietary water detect mode. It, requires conductivity levels of 100 microsiemens or greater, which is actually very useful because pH measurements with this general purpose pH electrode um, require no less than 100 microsiemens per centimeter in terms of conductivity of the sample. So if you're measuring in ultra fresh water or snow melt, for instance, then my recommendation would be to try it out. Um, but we do state that it, it shouldn't go below 100 microsiemens. It, it won't 
we can't guarantee that it'll function below 100 microsiemens per centimeter. <clears throat> Okay, so the MX2501 communicates over Bluetooth low energy. This is Bluetooth smart, um, solely to our Hobo mobile app at, at this point. So it doesn't communicate to just any Bluetooth app that you have that may collect advertisements from Bluetooth products. Um, you must have our free Hobo mobile app, iOS and Android. Lots of questions I received ahead of time refer to battery life. So it is a user replaceable AA battery. And at one minute intervals with Bluetooth always on, it should last one year at 25 degrees Celsius. So that's 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 like the extreme. We're measuring every minute with Bluetooth always advertising uh, at 25 degrees Celsius, it sh the battery should last one year. The other extreme is intervals of one minute with your Bluetooth always off, um, and that will get the battery at 25 degrees Celsius to last three years. And then the happy medium in the middle is our water detect, and that's specifically for battery um, saving, energy saving. Uh, it allows you to have the logger in the water with the Bluetooth off. Once it detects water, it'll turn off Bluetooth advertisements. Um, and then if you take the logger out of the water, it'll detect that it's not in water anymore, and we'll start advertising Bluetooth. This is nice because you don't have to push any buttons to, to start the Bluetooth advertisement. Um, it should start advertising right when it comes out of the water. It also increases that one year to two years at 25 degrees Celsius with one minute logging. Really cool feature. It is a battery life feature, not an absence presence of water feature. And then, of course, we have the caveat that says that uh, if you are logging faster or if you're adding in statistics and bursts, if you have it always connected with the app for some reason, uh, your battery life is definitely going to change. Temperature will also affect it. Oh, sorry. I'm going to go back real quick and just highlight this one spec right here, and that's the pH electrode life. We say six months. Uh, this is six months of continuous use. This is a recommendation that after six months, you consider, consider replacing the um, electrode with um, a new one. Alternatively, what you could do is have two electrodes and swap them out throughout the deployment um, so that you can clean properly the electrode, recondition it, especially if you're in fresh water. Deployments in fresh water will have a tendency to um, if it's really fresh with not a lot of salts in it, it'll have a tendency to dehydrate that gel layer. So it'd be good to have two electrodes to sort of swap out between, and, and the calibration of the second electrode should um, mitigate any concerns about differences in data. So six months uh, is the recommendation, but if at six months you're still getting a really good offset and a really good slope, then you don't need to replacement replace it. This is a recommendation. It is not an absolute. There isn't something in the logger that's going to stop reading pH six months, but it is good practice for you to keep an eye on that slope and offset as it's getting, as they're getting worse over time, which is expected. Um, pH electrodes are considered consumables. Um, you'll want to consider uh, replacing your electrode or at least purchasing one to have as a backup because that second that you have an electrode that doesn't work anymore, and you don't have a backup is a really bad place to be, and I've been there. And this may be just sorry, this may be a good point to elaborate a little bit because of this question. Um, so just to reiterate, it is not the same as the six-month life of our dissolved oxygen sensor replacement cap, which actually expires upon the seventh month. Um, as Inslee explained, again, we do recommend checking it. And best practice is probably an estimated six-month lifetime, but depending on the actual environmental conditions and um, you know how you've been maintaining the electrode, it could last a little bit longer. It may be a little bit less than that. Um, so that's really a best practice. It's not going to actually expire or stop working at the six-month mark. Um, and and a new electrode that you receive should fall within the acceptable range for slope and offset. Um, we are checking them before they go out to you. If you get an electrode that is not within the specs of acceptable slope and uh, and offset, then you should definitely contact our customer service.
service and we will help you out with that. However, if it's a six month old probe, even if you've been using it properly uh, and maintaining it properly, um, the decrease in condition is actually a normal thing over six months. So it is actually expected to, do, to decrease, especially if you have it deployed for six months free. Thanks for that question. That was a really good question. Wetted materials um, are PVC for the housing and the sensor end cap. We have polycarbonate closure caps and mounting end cap. Um, and then a TPE switch. That's the switch for turning on Bluetooth. Uh, and then the electrode itself is plastic bodied with Pellon junctions. Uh, the gel electrolyte is not a wetted material per se. So don't worry about that, but it is also not replaceable uh, being a gel electrolyte. This helps with maintenance and also life of the electrode. And then uh, it is a glass pH sensor bulb. So yes, this is glass. It's a rugged logger. It can be used in um, several applications. In terms of using it in um, sewage, for instance, I mean, pre-treatment sewage, it, it probably would work, but it would get pretty fouled pretty easy and pretty easily and pretty quickly. Um, Post-treatment, it can certainly be used in post-treatment. So um, it's rugged, but remember, keep in mind, it is a glass bulb. Uh, I put this slide up here because there are a couple people who are not in the United States uh, attending this. Actually, there are a lot of people not in the United States, and I just wanted to uh, confirm that our wireless communications comply with the wireless standards in the countries that they are used. Um, right now, we currently are certified for United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all the CE countries, and Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. If there's one that's not up there that you're looking for, please reach out to us and let us know, uh, and we'll see if that's one we maybe have just missed out on in the past. Okay, nearing the end of the presentation, we are now going to cover sort of some ideas on applications and frequently asked questions, which might answer some of the questions you've been sending. One last poll, if you're not tired of the polls yet, um, is this one. What is your general application? We're just interested to see who is planning on using a pH logger or is considering using a pH logger. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to answer that since I can't swap between the two. One question we may want to reiterate um, while we're taking the poll is yep. uh, what water or solution depth is required for accurate readings? I know we talked about how far the logger, um, you know, what depth the logger will operate to. Oh, yeah. So the amount of water you would need is essentially the amount of water required to cover the glass bulb junction and temperature sensor. So probably, oh man, I don't have it in front of me, the actual, maybe like two and a half, three inches. And then if you do it, if you deploy it that way and the water doesn't leave, then you should be able to um, also have your Bluetooth on and accessible uh, all the time. Or, yeah, actually, that would be a cool way to have it accessible often. And then also one more thing re re related to that is that um, pH electrodes, glass electrodes should never be allowed to get dry. This means those people who are doing intertidal studies or um, intermittent streams, for instance, anytime you expect that the electrode or the water level will go down, you should consider deploying the logger in a place that will allow the logger to keep, or the glass bulb to stay under water. If you allow it to get dry, you should recondition it and then recalibrate it, truly. And actually, if, if you have a freak accident or a crazy tide that it actually, you did deploy it with it underwater um, at low tide, but then you had an extreme low tide. You'll be able to notice that if you've used the water detect nodes, maybe it's not meant for that, but you might be able to see when the water went away and for how long. And if it was for like 10 minutes, you should probably be fine. But if it was for more than that or even hours, then definitely it will require recalibration and rehydration. It's down, expanding on that question from Bill. He also asks if we have a similar um, device to measure conductivity. So Bill, you may or may not be aware we do have conductivity salinity data loggers. 
They do not currently have Bluetooth capability. Um, it's something that we are definitely looking at, you know, applying to all of our water quality data loggers. It's just a matter of timing and prioritization. So um, with your permission, we're going to assume it's okay to enter a new product request for a Bluetooth connectivity logger on your behalf. And <laughs> we will definitely keep you posted on, uh, on the status of that. Yeah, thanks for that question, Bill. Um, okay, so our quick poll, quick responses from everybody. It's interesting to see that most of you are freshwater people. Um, it's not too much of a shock that's a big customer base for us. Yeah. Um, I am intrigued, actually, at the other. Um, I'd love to hear what other applications you are. If you could shoot us uh, something in the questions, that would be nice for us to be able to see and, and hopefully be able to target your market in a way that's useful to you in the future if this doesn't meet your needs. Um, same with water resource management. That's not that's something that I would love to hear more about personally. Thanks for answering that. I promise it was the last one. <laughs> Some applications include the um, obviously ocean acidification, but yes, please note this pH logger, and I'm answering a fact question before I get to it. This logger measures NBS scale, um, not total hydrogen. So a lot of ocean acidification people use total hydrogen scale for their measurements. Um, that requires special buffers and a special, not a special procedure, it's a very similar procedure, but the buffers are special and um, we would have to increase the accuracy much more than what it is and also be able to accept custom buffers and maybe that's something that we will look into in the future. If, um, uh, sorry, I'm just speaking on this thing. If, you, if you're looking for a pH logger that's measuring within the total hydrogen ion scale, then um, definitely let me know uh, or let us know with follow-ups after the, the webinar because we'd like to hear about that and log that as a potential for a future product. Another application that we were expecting people to be interested in pH logging was um, oyster farms. This is Matunic Oyster Farm in Rhode Island. Um, we just expected that changes in the ocean salinity was going to affect the development of oysters. Another one, and some of the attendees might recognize this, is um, environmental labs for industrial sites like uh, nuclear power plants, et cetera. They're interested in monitoring pH. We also have aquaculture. Uh, aquaculture really, really is mostly dependent on DO and temperature, for instance, but and conductivity in some cases, but also pH is, is relevant for aquaculture as well, or mariculture. Acid mine drainage, uh, as you can see, this is a disgusting slurry of acid mine drainage um, that the waters can be down to three, pH three, and so monitoring the treatment of these waters pre and post treatment uh, might be something that would be considered for a pH logger. And then finally, we have uh, stream health, river and stream health, aquatic health uh, in fresh water, which most of you seem to probably know more than I do about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you have other applications that I've missed or other ideas about how you would plan on using this and you're concerned about whether the logger can meet those needs, let me know, please, or let us know uh, so that we can either follow up with a phone call and talk to you about it. I can maybe learn more about what you're doing, and also Becky can definitely ha answer most of your questions as well. Frequently asked questions are, does the logger feature use re replaceable electrodes? So yes, it's actually really nice that you have the capability of ordering a replacement electrode and having it on hand. You do not have to send your logger in for calibration. You do not have to send the logger in to replace the electrode. Um, this is all on you and at your leisure. With that, it also, as I said, features a user replaceable battery. Same thing, you don't have to mail it in and be out a logger while you're having a battery replaced. The type of pH electrode is a glass ball, plastic bodied, double junction electrode with a Pellon junction and a gel reference non-replaceable electrolyte. Other glass bulb electrodes have a liquid electrolyte and as those get depleted, you can always refill them. In this case, the gel does not, it's not replaceable, but it's much longer. 
And then I've sort of already touched on this. And if you're interested, I can go into more detail offline. Um, but calibration procedure for freshwater and saltwater, if you are only interested in the NBS scale, then um, it should be the same. If, however, you're looking for the total hydrogen scale, I sort of mentioned some ways it'll be different. But um, definitely consider the uh, that this is something we might consider for the future. OK. At this point, I'd like to open it up for any questions, um, comments, concerns. And I'm probably going to read through the questions right now and yeah. answer what I, sorry about that, <laughs> what I can. Let me see. You may want to elaborate. Um, well, I can talk about this. Is it best to calibrate the log or at the temperature you anticipate seeing in the field? Yes. Yes. Um, I made a note, Sean, turn in to email you some reference information about slide 20. Um, we'll definitely see what else we can dig up and, and get over to you. Um, I will personally follow up with an email or a phone call over the next day or two to address that. Average lifetime of the probe electrode, we did cover that, I think, in pretty good detail, Andre. Um, probably best practice is around six months, but the actual lifetime will depend on the maintenance of the electrode, the exposure to environmental factors, um, any fouling. Um, it will not actually expire after six months. Um, we just recommend that you check it relatively frequently, depending on the application. We talked about the allowable, the allowable temperature range in detail, but feel free to contact us again, Steve, if you missed that slide. Yeah, how this will hold up in a municipal wastewater plant. Um, I can definitely check our customer base in terms of who has purchased and used it thus far. Um, so that's something, Stephen, that um, Inslee and I can both look into. Well, I can, I can actually oh, answer okay. this one. So um, in a municipal wastewater plant, as I said earlier, the pretreatment part where it's sludgy and, and, and kind of um, gross, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's possible that the uh, logger and electrode will get dirty pretty easily. So in that case, I would argue this probably isn't good for the pretreatment side of it, um, which means the, the users would have to continue to do spot checks or use industrial grade pH electrodes in line. Um, if, however, the water is treated and it's not too gross, there's not too much possible sludge that would build up on the pH electrode, then they could definitely deploy this there, uh, depending on making sure that it's within the temperature range. Um, that we specify. So yeah, this is some, that's something actually I was considering um, while designing this product, but as it's just a general purpose pH logger at this point, um, maybe it would be worthwhile talking to you to, just, to discover whether it's a new product that we would need to look into to make this more of a rugged for pretreatment wastewater. And Steve and I will definitely check to see if we have any um, municipal wastewater plant customers that are doing um, that are monitoring of the pH logger as of yet and what kind of, um, you know, results they're seeing and more specifics about the application. Um, and then the next question about temperature, 55 to 60 degrees Celsius is outside of the range of the logger. Um, this, the, the range that we provide is two, uh, has two purposes. One, it is the range within we can accurately we can comfortably state our accuracy statement and resolution. Um, however, outside of that range, I'm not sure how that will affect your accuracy. If you don't need it to be as good as 0.1, then that's always something that um, that you can, you'd have to decide on your own. But also, that temperature, that high, I mean, it is PVC and it's getting pretty hot, but I think really your main concern might be how the electrode responds. So. Uh, if you'd like me to look into that further, please feel free to reach out. I, sorry, I'm going to put up this slide for you, too, with some helpful links. Um, one, you're sort of allowing me to segue to this slide, and this slide also has been made into a handout for you all to download. Um, we have how-to videos. Right now, we have one. We did just launch it, but it's the how to replace the pH electrode that should be posted by the end of this week. And future videos that I'll be putting together are... Um, are how to calibrate the MX2501, how to the pH electrode, and anything else that you think we should do. Um, so just, yeah, let me know about that if you have anything that you would like to see in terms of a how-to video. 
and you can follow that link to see those. Also, the user manual can be found at that link that's there. Um, another place to find useful information about all of our loggers, always, is the knowledge base, where you can type in a question and several options will come up. It's one of my favorite places to go when I have my own questions. And finally, for customer contact, sorry, sales and customer support contact, international customers should definitely go to the link listed there. And those who are US end users can contact um, Becky for all other customers, um, distributors, partners, et cetera, then reach out to your channel managers. Okay, next question. Sean, thanks for that question. Um, I'm gonna, I'll answer, answer that. that I'm gonna answer that. Turn and, off the water detect feature. Right, so for waters that are less than 100 microsiemens per centimeter, um, you definitely can, the, the feature is uh, an optional feature that the user can turn on and off. What measures should be taken if we are to deploy the pH logger at freezing conditions and ice encasement is a possibility? Aha, uh -huh. um, right, so if it's possible that the logger will get frozen and mainly the electrode will get frozen, it's really the electrode, the glass bulb of the electrode uh, that you're concerned about. Um, it has a liquid inside of it. There is a gel electrolyte, but the glass bulb itself has a liquid inside of it. It is a salty liquid, but it, it, it's possible and likely that it could freeze at certain temperatures. Um, <laughs> my recommendation would be that don't deploy it in freezing waters if it's going to be encased. I, I, I mean, honestly, in, in respect for your research or, or, or data, I would suggest considering not deploying it there or maybe being crafty like Bear girls and stuffing it with pine trees. I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I'm not experienced enough with that. And if you'd like to give me a, a shoot us a call or an email, I can follow up with you on that and, and talk to some, our, some of our engineers to find out more. Thanks for the question, though. Okay, next question. I am in a main lake using a data logger for DO and temp. What would I gain by adding pH to my testing and how would it benefit the learning, the health of my lake? Uh, that depends on the purpose of your research, I think. Um, DO and temp are great ways to look at the health of a water system. pH is also helpful, for instance, if you have fertilizers up, upstream that are being washed into your rivers and then down to your lake um, or passing through your lake or accumulating in your lake because the acidity or basicness, basicity of your, <laughs> of your um, lake will also determine how the aquatic plants maybe uptake those pesticides, herbicides, et cetera. Um, that's one way that it might affect it. I would be interested to hear what exactly it is you're doing in more detail so that maybe I can um, answer that more pointedly. What is the range of the Bluetooth feature? Oh, that's a good, sorry, I did not say it. I, thank you. Uh, the range is 100, foot, 100 feet line of sight. Console replacement electrode. Oh, the replacement electrode is $115 at this point which is a really good, I think, competitive price. Do you have an idea of the price Onset will be selling? Oh, okay. Yeah. And is there any type of warranty on the 2501 or on the replacement electrode? Yeah. I'm gonna let Becky yeah. answer that one. Um, as with all Hobo um, data loggers and sensors, they all come standard with a one year repair or replace warranty. Um, we also offer the option of a second year or as many additional years as you want extended warranties and the price would be 10% of the total product list price for um, each year that you want to extend that warranty. Um, we also offer free technical support for all of our products. That service is available via phone, email, and live chat from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time, Monday through Friday. Um, we have a really excellent technical support team. Um, and again, that's a free service. There's no upcharge for, you know, expedited support. We always just try to take calls or return calls and inquiries as quickly as possible. Um, and again, we'll troubleshoot with you if it's determined that there's a product defect um, or it's not working in alliance and, um, excuse me, in compliance with the specifications that we publish, then we will either repair or replace it um, at no cost. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to let Becky yeah. handle Stephen. I will get in touch with you directly about the quote. Thank you very much. And okay, I'm going to go to Nick's question. I'm, well, he's not here anymore, but I'm just going to yeah. answer it. Assuming I know that the water will have a conductance far below 100 microsieverts per centimeter, is there any way to turn off the water detect? Yes. So we did answer that. I'm, I, I'm sorry we didn't catch you before you left, Nick. Hopefully you'll download the presentation. I can't um, I think I inadvertently somehow <laughs> Natalia, in. your question about Bluetooth EO logger, I missed we missed we're missing the beginning of that question. Sorry about that. Um I think I inadvertently deleted the first P H E C and temp in one unit would be great. Uh -huh. So the more we hear about multi-par uh, loggers, the more likely we are to potentially think about business for it. So um, we are happy to hear more requests for that. We will definitely log that as another NPR, aka new product request. Hydroponics and related plant growing systems routinely need to monitor pH and EC. So yes, this is a great thing uh, for multi-pars. I totally understand that. Um, Okay, I don't, oh, that's an application, got it. Thank yeah. you, Kenny, I appreciate that. Thank you, that. Kenny. And, oh, I hope I see this right. I, you, thank you as well. Acid mine drainage, yep, thank you. Thanks for attending, sorry we went over a little bit. We're happy to have been here with you. Um, and no, we haven't measured dicks in water. I know that that's a specific, I'm hoping you're referring to to the uh, total hydrogen scale and, and using Dixon's um, calibration buffers. At this point with our electrode, again, it's not designed to, to, to do that. I might be misunderstanding the question though. The yeah. anti-fouling cap, the, the copper anti-fouling cap that's there is good for biofouling. It's pretty decent. Um, we've seen some really good results with that. In terms of sediment fouling or uh, in terms of uh, sludge or slurries, it, unless we use a mechanical way of removing that fouling, it's, it's just not going to be you, the normal maintenance that you would expect with any other logger is there. I think um, we talked about the price yep. of the Electro 115. Oh, dishwashing machines. So mm -hmm. I've had this question before. Uh, the logger it could be fine in terms of whether the glass electrode gets, uh, the glass bulb gets exposed to being quote unquote dry for a bit, because I don't imagine that the washing machine will be left dry with it in there. The concern that I have with washing machines is that detergents are um, abrasive and will likely abrade the glass bulb of the electrodes. So that's something to consider that this isn't really meant for that. Um, yeah, so I understand the application, but it's it's just I don't think this water is perfect for that. Unless you're running it through a machine without any detergent. Yeah, I mean, if you're <laughs> sterilizing it at a temperature below the acceptable operating temperature range, then it might be worthwhile. I'm not sure. If you want to talk more about that, though, definitely contact the appropriate salesperson. Yeah, I think I've been working with David. Okay. Uh, Application of the body out of the water. Oh uh, yeah, so if you deploy the logger with just the temperature sensor and pH electrode um, submerged in uh, the sample, you therefore are leaving the Bluetooth um, peat chip outside of the water, so it should be accessible from your phone. Um, the idea there would be you would have it on constant advertising, you know, always on Bluetooth. So that when you, if you have multiple, for instance, we have a um, potential customer in Taiwan, I think, who is interested in deploying this in tanks inside of a building. And they have multiple tanks and they want one in each and they want to be able to download them without having to go to each one and select, you know, blue, turn Bluetooth on or remove it from water to get the Bluetooth to turn on. So the idea is they're going to deploy it with the Bluetooth bit out and when they walk into the building, they are capable of downloading um, all of the Bluetooth loggers um, without having to really do much. The con for that obviously is the battery life of it. Um, but if you're monitoring or if your intervals are five minutes or 10 minutes and you have Bluetooth always on, again, that, that logger with no statistics and no bursts at, at a decent temperature 
in terms of battery life. Um, you really shouldn't expect to have to replace that battery too soon. Matthew, I am going to get back to you after the uh, webinar because that's an interesting um, question that I went into a lot of detail with the engineers and it, and it might be too long since we're sort of over our one hour. Um, but I will, I will definitely contact you. Okay. Oh, I see, Steve. Now I see why you're asking that question. So yeah, I've actually heard. I I I think you were the one that was asking, Steve. You were asking about um, wastewater treatment potentially. Um, I have heard people. There's a municipality in Iowa, maybe somewhere that made their own pH logger, and what they were doing is exactly what you're mentioning, and that is um, understanding where in the line people are illegally dumping, for instance, chemicals or substances. And, and what they did is they made their own using a, in, an industrial pH electrode and then like a pelican case with a logger inside or a meter inside. And it was very crafty, but I think they would totally be interested in this product um, because they were using it. And the story they told was that they were having a lot of excursions and they were um, out of compliance and they couldn't figure out why or where. Um, in some cases, you can see around the manhole what was going on, but in some cases you can't. And so they were deploying these loggers in various places throughout the, the system, and they could see upstream, downstream, and in the middle, obviously, where the, the issue was coming from. So, yes, I understand you don't have x-ray vision, and that's something that we're hoping to help you with, and I think this would totally be applicable for that, for sure. Okay, so let's see. Uh -huh. Thanks for that, Steve, as well. Um, the the multi-parameter parameters are useful yeah. to know. Oh, RP, we're hearing a lot about that, definitely. <laughs> Isaac, good question. At this point, the case is cylindrical or tubular, <laughs> and it will likely stay that way for now. But thanks for asking. Um, okay, let's see. I'm not sure I follow the replacement electrode is suggested to change every six months. Right, because you could purchase the electrode, keep it stored for six months, and then deploy it for six months, and it's still within your one-year warranty. Or you could keep it stored for 10 months and, it, and then deploy it, and maybe two months in, it, it has, it's showing that it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing, then you could answer or, or call us up and we would help you work that out. Um, and again, I'd like to remind you the six months is just a recommendation. The real indicator of whether it needs to be replaced or not is uh, slope and offset. Thanks, Matt, for that application. Definitely worth logging for us. Okay, let's see. Okay, yeah, this is, Steve, maybe I need to call you and come visit your facility. <laughs> I need to learn about this, so um, definitely would love to do that. I'll reach out afterwards for sure. Okay, I think we went through all of it. You guys, those 40 of you who stuck around for the end, the very, very end and over, I really, really appreciate it. You guys, um, I know it was a lot of material and you had some really awesome questions and we appreciate your participation in the polls. So. Um, keep an eye out for the follow-up survey that will be sent out, as well as access to the recording. And as always, our um, customer service, sales department, and even our product marketing team, we're always there to help our customers out and um, learn more from our customers. So give us a call um, or shoot us an email on, through the web. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>